serve a risen Savior. He's alive and well this morning. Amen. Amen. I'm going to pray with you and I want you to watch this video and listen carefully, okay? So let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be here. We are here to celebrate this morning, to celebrate an empty tomb. We serve a resurrected Lord and we're thankful for that. Father, I pray that you would draw us to you this morning. Teach us and lead us, Lord. And I pray that when we leave here today, um, that the celebration wouldn't stop, but it would just continue on in our lives, and people around us will be able to see and to tell that there's a living Lord because you live within us. Father, thank you for this special time and place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Just watch and listen. Early on Friday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the entrance. She went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. They have taken the Lord from the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. Then Peter and the other disciple went to the tomb. The two of them were running, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and saw the linen cloths, but he did not go in. Behind him came Simon Peter, and he went straight into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the cloth which had been around Jesus' head. It was not lying with the linen cloths, but was rolled up by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. He saw and believed. They still did not understand the scripture which said that he must rise from death. Then the disciples went back home. Mary stood crying outside the tomb. While she was still crying, she bent over and looked in the tomb.
receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Unless I see the scars of the nails in his hands, and put my finger on those scars, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. out your hand and put it in my side. Stop your doubting and believe. My Lord and my God.
as we celebrate.
happy resurrection morning to you. We hope you have enjoyed the celebration this morning. We had a good time this morning. And, um, it continues. It continues on. I'm excited to share the scripture with you this morning. We have other things going on. And, uh, the songs that we're singing hold a special story, a powerful story. If you just listen to the words we sing, we're going to have a children's sermon in a moment. We're going to sing again before that. But I want you to know that everything in the bulletin, all the Bible studies coming up and all the, the things going on this week, um, keep those things in mind. Uh, we continue to come to those Bible studies um, and uh, be uh, active there. If you'll notice um, the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, our goal is $1,500 and we have given $1,466. Does somebody have $34? <laughs> That's all we need, $34. That's in your bulletin. I told you last week you wouldn't hear about that again, but I just thought I'd read it to you and I'll mention it again, so we're that, that close. But anyway, um, I want you to turn to the back of your bulletin to the prayer request, and I have a couple to add that um, I was asked to add here recently. Um, there is a, a lady who passed. Uh, her name was Melissa. We don't have a last name yet, but if you remember, Melissa's family. This was all of a sudden. Um, also, I uh, remember Luther Hurl. This is uh, James Hurl's brother. I just remember Luther Hurl. And also Lee Calhoun. Um, Lee Calhoun is kin to Miss Laurie. And so pray for Lee. Also, we have been praying for Trey Jordan for some time. A young man who's been struggling with quite a lot of physical problems. He passed away last night, and we, we need to pray for his family. So if you would pray for Trey Jordan family, um, I believe that the family feels it's a blessing. Uh, he has wrestled and wrestled, uh, and they have wrestled with this and prayed about this and trusted the Lord in this. So pray for Trey Jordan family. And also, as James already mentioned in his offertory prayer, we are so thankful to see Terry and Rhonda Lilly back today. Um, they have been... Y'all been on vacation for the last few months? Five weeks. Five weeks. Five weeks. I've been counting. He has not been a vacation. No vacation, no vacation whatsoever. Um, we're so thankful you're back and the Lord's answer to prayer there. That's certainly a praise. And it's so good to see the rest of you. A lot of you have been through some tests and surgeries and recovered from different things. And it's so good to see you. And I'm so glad you're here today. Um, also, um, Brother Dave Yelton, uh, this is uh, Tom and Sandy's neighbor, Dave and Kay Yelton. Dave always helps us uh, with the uh, shepherd's table. Very humble in spirit. I talked to Dave on the phone briefly this week. Uh, he's having trouble getting breath, and breath enough to speak. But uh, Dave is in much need of prayer. And I asked him if we, if we had, could pray for him and if I had permission to share with you. Dave has an phone and several other things that are giving him quite serious problems. And so he is in great need of prayer. So please lift Dave and Kay Yelton up in your prayers if you would. That would be, be wonderful. All right. And if there are others, please make a note or uh, let us know. Others we can add to the prayer list uh, later on. We're going to sing, and then I want to spend some time with our young folks here, the, the young, young folks, um, and uh, spend time with them. But this song says, Light of the world, you step down in the darkness in this world. Open my eyes and let me see <coughs> beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. That's a life that walks with you, remains. Do you remember that from the other night? Our Monday, Thursday service. Hope of a life spent with you, remaining in you, abiding in you. John 15, 5. Let's stand again, if you would, and let's sing, Here I Am to Worship.
inside of you, inside of you, right in there. What's in there? What's in there? Nothing. Inside of you. Yes. Your kidneys. Your heart. Your heart. Stay up. Yeah, not kidneys. We stay up here to our heart. <laughs> your heart. Did you know that your heart is built like this specifically, not for eggs, but specifically for something special? Do you know what? It's not like this that you can put anything in that you want to, but your heart is specifically shaped for God. You want to you know, know that? Right? Make your hand do a fist, right? It's, and that's the size of your heart. That's the size of your heart. That's right, James. This is what makes today so special is because Jesus went to the cross. He was buried in a tomb and he raised up again. He's alive today and he wants to live in your hearts. He wants to live in your hearts because there is a God-sized hole in your heart. You want the microphone, don't you? Okay. okay. So I want you to understand that that's why we celebrate today because Jesus died and rose again so he can live in your heart. There's one last thing here and I'll let you go. We have to ask him to live in our heart. We have to trust him and invite him into our heart. And then he moves in. Okay? So y'all remember that because a lot of times people want to put everything in their heart except the Lord. And he's... He pays for everything. Your life, your health, everything. He pays for our salvation. That's the most important thing. Y'all been really good and very helpful.
one thing about that song that sometimes is offensive to folks because it assigns at least some of the blame, and I say some there loosely, to us. We must take some ownership of that. And, uh, and some folks have a lot of trouble taking any ownership of that. As the Romans crucified Christ, they physically crucified him, but it was for our sin. And sometimes we have trouble getting past that. I, I don't want to take any ownership there. I wouldn't have put Jesus on the cross for the fact of the matter is we did. Because it was our sin that he had to go to the cross to pay a price. And because of that, you and I can be redeemed. Okay. You with me so far? Yeah. How many of you ate breakfast after sunrise service? Raise your hand. Alright, if you see these folks falling asleep, you're going to go... <laughs> Punch them a little bit because they tend to fall asleep after they eat. Okay, to keep them awake. I appreciate you being here. It's been a great week. It has been such a powerful week in Scripture. There's so much that's gone on this week with the Lord and the Scripture. And as He's sharing with His apostles, as He was preparing them for Him leaving and for this ministry not to come to an end, but to transition from His physical leadership to His spiritual leadership via the Holy Spirit indwelling each of them. And they were quite nervous and quite scared. Have you ever been scared, nervous? Mm -hmm. How about fear? <laughs> fearful? Full of trepidation? Just, I don't, I'm, I'm afraid. Did you know that they were afraid? Did you know that in Matthew 28, at the end there, right before Jesus ascended, they were full of fear? They had walked with Jesus three years. They had seen all the miracles they had heard the stories. They had listened to him plan for his kingdom coming. And they had seen him be tortured and beaten. They had seen him be crucified on a cruel cross. They had seen him be laid into a borrowed tomb. And now they had seen him raised from the dead, show his physical signs of crucifixion. And they still were full of fear. Why? Because their leader was physically leaving. They didn't know what to do. Have you ever been to that place in your life where you thought you had figured out God and, and your relationship with God and then you came against something, an obstacle or a wall or something that was really difficult and you said, I don't have anything figured out anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where they were this week as Jesus was talking to them. And today, as he comes out of that tomb and he gives them life, in the video that you watched early on in the service, something changed drastically when Jesus and was talking to Mary Magdalene there in the tomb. And she's looking for him and, and believes somebody stole his body and this man speaks to her and she doesn't recognize him. Why, we really don't know. It says earlier it was dark early in the morning and it could have still been dark and she didn't recognize him at first. Whatever the reason, when he spoke her name, she knew who it was. The Bible says the shepherd speaks and his sheep knows him, knows his name. He spoke her name and she recognized him. And in that conversation, he said, go tell my brethren, my brothers and sisters. And then in Matthew 28, as he's getting ready to give the Great Commission, he also talks to his brethren. This is one of the major, major changes that happened. This is the new covenant. We are now... Adopted into the family. We are now joint heirs with Jesus. Can you imagine? Jesus is perfect. He's God in the flesh. He's God's son. He's holy. Yet we become joint heirs. And that's why his, his vocabulary changed at this point. And he starts referring to those who have followed him, his, his students, now as his brothers and his sisters, those that followed him. So closely, and that's how he refers to you and me if we place our faith and trust in him. I want to take you to John, uh, uh, excuse me, not John, that was the other day. I want to take you to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And there are three different sections here in this one chapter. Paul is talking about the resurrection, he's talking about the significance of the resurrection. And the first thing he does. As he talks about the historical argument of the resurrection. You remember the case for Christ, Lee Strobel, and his um, story 
he was an editor in Chicago Tribune and his wife became a believer in Christ and he said, I'm not having any of this. When we married, it was supposed to be just me and you. I'm not sharing you with this Jesus person. And he set out to disprove Christianity. And in the two-year period of time, as he was trying desperately to disprove it, everything that he ran across gave more evidence that it was true. And at the end of that two years, he gave his heart and life to the Lord Jesus and he's continued to share Christ. And he wrote the book, The Case for Christ, and we've seen the movie in the past. I've been reading that this week because there's an Easter version. And he talks about the physical evidence of the burial, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not just in the Bible, and that's enough for us, but for people who are non-believers, there's over 30 other examples in historical books of a, the physical person of Jesus Christ and his, his crucifixion and resurrection. Paul directly talks about that here. I want you to hear what he says. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 11, give the historical argument for the resurrection. He says, Now may I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you. That's an important conditional clause there. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And you know that this is a metaphor in scripture. It means those that have already passed away. Some of them have already died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as it were, to one untimely born. He appeared to me also. And Paul gives reference to his born again experience as the Lord stopped him in his tracks. And verse 9 says, For I am the least of the apostles who am, I, who am not fit um, to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. His grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored in more, even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Paul says there's a lot of physical evidence for the resurrection of our Lord. There is. But it's one thing that we had to study in school about the physical <coughs> evidence. Historians. There are, there are so many people that have studied and so many just like Lee Strobel that have come to this to try to disprove this. It is a documented fact that Jesus Christ died on a cruel cross, was buried in a tomb, and resurrected. And Paul makes note here to say he appeared to all these people and over 500 people saw him. There are eyewitness accounts of him walking around after he was buried and, and after he resurrected. He also deals with the logical argument here in verses 12 through 19. He says, now think about this. If Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? I've given you proof. He says, but some of you still don't believe in the resurrection. He dealt with this a lot in his ministry. Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we witnessed against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Now we'll stop here just a second and, and reiterate something I said this morning in sunrise service. If Jesus Christ did not raise again, if he is not a resurrected Lord, we are wasting our time. It is not just a an, an part, an element of the Christian life. It is the foundation for our faith. We serve a risen Lord. This morning I shared the sunrise service about Buddha, the Buddha and uh, about Muhammad. And you can find their tomb. You can find where they're buried, where their ashes are. 
Jesus is not in the tomb. We serve a God who's living. Why is that significant? Because He promises us life. Life here and life eternal. If He can't defeat death, how can He promise us life after we die physically? So the resurrection of our Lord is imperative to our faith. You can't have a Christian faith without believing wholeheartedly that Jesus raised from the dead. And that's what Paul is saying. Listen, you'll have to believe this. Otherwise, our preaching is in vain. Your faith is in vain. We're just wasting our time. The last thing he says is a the theological argument. Listen to what he says in verses 20 and through 22. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. In other words, the down payment for those who are asleep because they're going to need to be raised from the dead as well. The first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. Who's the man that brought death? Adam. Okay. By a man also came the resurrection of the dead, that being Jesus. Verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. All shall be made alive. Is it important that we believe in the resurrection of our Lord? Do you really believe that? Yes. Do you live that way? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> A little hesitancy there. This is what I want to share with you today. Jesus didn't go through what he went through. He didn't redeem us. He didn't go through the, the beatings and all the cruel things that he endured, buried in a borrowed tomb, raised from the dead, give his great commission to his apostles and disciples around him, and send back into the heaven be the right hand of the Father, and send the Holy Spirit to indwell his believers so we can live a mediocre life, so we can go through life in a negative, critical way of saying, Life just comes up a little short for me every single day. <clears throat> Jesus died so you could be more than conquerors in this life. And then have eternal life. Y'all understand? Have eternal life later on. It's not God died for me. He did all these things. Jesus sent. And Jesus gave us his life. He did all these wonderful things. And I just can't wait to get out of here. I just can't wait to get out of here because it's just, you know, are you living a victorious life? If you're not, it's not because he, did, he fell short of his goal. Jesus paid the price. And he's alive and well. And he lives in you and me as his children. And if you walk around all day like the Schlepprock, and I always use him for an example because I remember him. Y'all remember him? The cartoon character that always had the cloud and was always raining on his head. Y'all remember that, okay? Some of us act that way. The only reason the world knows we attend churches is because we have a bumper sticker. That's it, okay? We drive like the world. We talk like the world. We drink like the world. We smoke like the world. We take part in everything about the world. And then we show up Sunday morning for church with our bumper sticker. That's not the life that Jesus died to give us. Jesus died to make us victorious in this life. And I shared with the group this morning, that's how Paul can write letters of encouragement to the new churches while he's in chains. That's how Joseph, being a, 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 a captive prisoner, separated from all his family, can rise to the occasion of being used of God to be second in command in Egypt and tell his brothers who sold him into slavery, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. He placed me here. Because of Jesus, because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of God's plan of redemption, He loves you. The question is not, does He love you? That's a moot point at this point because He's demonstrated His love to us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for you and me. The real point is, do we love Him back? Do you love Him back? Do you live a life of victory because you believe what He says, you trust in the death burial, and resurrection of the Lord, and you live that way. The Lord says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. It is the one who keeps my commandments that loves me. It's not a question of whether he loves you or not. Of course he does. And he has given everything he has. He's given his best to demonstrate that to you and to me. 
What have we given to demonstrate our love for Him? Well, I'm just too busy. My life is just a mess. wonder why. <laughs> Sometimes we get so busy wrapped up in our own mess. You know that Satan just loves that. He gives us all chasing our tail. He loves that. I'm so confused and so messed up in this life. Then you don't have time to focus on Him and to make disciples. And He knows that. That was Jesus' last command, make disciples. Sometimes we want to retreat. You ever want to retreat? Be honest now. And I don't mean right now during preaching. You ever want to retreat? Ever want to hide sometimes and just get away from people? I used to love to ask people at Lowe's when I went in there almost every day. How's your day going? And they would always look at their watch. It would be fine about 30 minutes because that's when they got work. And they would say the same thing. If it wasn't for people, I'd have a great day. People get in my way. Those people. Have you ever said that? Those people. You know you are one, right? We are one. We are people. If people get in your way, if this life is so rough that you say, Lord, just take me out of here, you missed the point. Why wouldn't God just take us out of here the moment we placed our faith in Him? Because Jesus left us a very important commission. He says, as you're going through this life, you make disciples. Here's your lifeboat. Now get everybody else in it that you can. No, I just want to pad my lifeboat. I, I just, Lord, just give me a better paddle here. This lifeboat's getting worn out here. I just, I just want a better lifeboat. The purpose of a lifeboat. The purpose of a lifeboat is to rescue souls that are dying, right? You with me? How many of your friends and neighbors, how many of the people we encounter know that there's a Jesus who loves them that conquered death, hell, and the grave and is alive forevermore and offers that same life and victory to them? How much? How many of them know that? We keep distance from folks because we don't want to interfere. We don't want to offend them. We don't want to be inter interfered. We don't want to be offended. And we sometimes just, just back off. Folks, we can't live a victorious life that way. It's not made for you and me to just enjoy the fair or the circus all by ourselves. You know how much it costs to get to Carowinds right now? $90.21. Y'all been to Carowinds lately? Laurie wants to go. <laughs> Y'all ever been there when there wasn't any lines? You could just go from one ride to the next. Y'all remember it's like... I can do this sometimes. And then sometimes you'd be there and the line would be forever more. You'd maybe ride three rides and you'd have it. I remember one time going snow skiing and it was it was a holiday and all the schools were out and we got to go down the slope maybe three times at the most. And it was night and night and there. You know, it takes forever to get your skis and your boots and your poles and everybody's walking around like, you know, I can't do this. It takes you forever to get outside and you got all this garb on. And by the time you get to the chairlift, you're sweating and trying to pull your clothes off. And it's just, whew, it's hard work. There's a line. People want to go. And sometimes you get excited because there's not many people there. You know, this is great. And sometimes in life, we'd rather have it that way. God's just you and me. <laughs> the rest of those folks, I don't want them around. It's just you and me. We can have a good time. It's not God's plan. It's our plan. God's plan is for you and me to get involved, to get into this world, not of it, in it, not of it, in it. That means we get to know folks. We take the risen Lord within us, the Holy Spirit, and we go and we talk to them. We get to know them. We share Christ with them, folks. We've been in our own little churchy lifeboats by ourselves for too long. It's time to invite some people to get in the lifeboat with us, but they don't look like me and they smell different. They look different. They don't listen to the same kind of music. You don't have to confess, but have you ever been there? I've been there. Jesus is a resurrected Lord. And His life means you have life. His victory means you have victory. His conquering death means you and I have conquered death. We will die physically, but it's just a doorway from here to there, into eternity. Our saints that have been here, I think of all the folks that used to sit here in this room, just in the last 23 years that I've been here, there's a lot of them that have passed on. A lot of them. They went through the door from this temporary place that's filled with all kinds of pain and struggles and all kinds of stuff into an eternal place where there's no more of that. 
And we know how to get there. Jesus says in John, I'm the door. It's real simple. I'm the door. I'm the way. Why would we keep that ourselves? Today, folks, we're here to celebrate a risen Lord. And then we're to do something about it. We know in the scripture I've read to you as Paul gives logical evidence. He gives historical evidence. He gives theological evidence for the resurrection of our Lord. There are over 30 secular historians, whether they're newspapers or writings or journals or something that give historical evidence of the resurrected Lord. We have the proof. We say we believe it. Now we've got to share it with this world we live in or we have missed the whole point. You with me? I don't think so. <laughs> that was pretty weak. Yes. Thank you. There you go. There's one. Are we always going to be obedient to the Lord's great commission? There are going to be days when we have to say, forgive me. I didn't talk to that person. I just read to you in a devotion the other day as Will Graham, Billy Graham's grandson, confessed that he missed an opportunity and he said that he apologized to the Lord. He said, I'll never do that again. But he missed an opportunity and each of us do that a lot. But folks, this day is not that special if we don't tell people about it. If we really believe it, we can't help but tell people about it and live a life of victory. Live a life of joy. Live a life above our circumstances. Not above our means. Above our circumstances. That's a different sermon. <laughs> you with me there? Sometimes I run into people and they're just complaining and griping and fussing. And, and, and we get to talk and, and I, they ask, what do you do? Well, I work at Homewood Baptist Church. What do you do there? Not much, according to some people. But anyway, <laughs> I preach. I preach there and lead the music. And immediately, almost immediately, it's, oh, I'm a member of so-and-so. I'm thinking, wait a minute, you were just complaining and griping and fussing and cussing and doing all this. And now you're telling me you're a member of the church. I could not have told. What we're supposed to do, folks, is be enough of a light in this world that they know before we tell them. Amen. And it's not about Homewood Baptist Church. It's about the kingdom of God. Do they know that you're a member of the kingdom of God? Forget about Homewood for just a second. Before we even say it, can they sense it? Sometimes we want our wings and we're still worms. You got that? Sometimes we want to fly. We want to be like the angels. We want our wings. We want God to give us our assurance that we're going to heaven. But we act like worms. We haven't become a butterfly. Because we still want to drag old life with us. And he says, no, no, no. The old things have passed. All things have become new. It's about transformation. That's the whole deal about the, the crystals and the butterflies. It's not the same anymore. It doesn't crawl around and act like it used to act. Now it flies. So you got to choose. You want wings or you want to be a worm? Choose. Because Jesus died so that we could... Be the light in this dark world as he shines through us. We can live victorious. We can stand in the line when there's one cashier and there's a thousand people there. And we can find a reason to smile and cut up with the people around us. Instead of spending that whole time complaining and griping and fussing just like everybody else. You just need to look at it and have a captive audience. Thank you, Lord. The Lord said, I can share the gospel. I need to share the gospel. He commanded me. Look at all these people. They're stuck in line. They're not going anywhere. It's only one cashier. Thank you, Lord. What's your name? How can I pray for you besides this line? How can we? How's your week going? Tell me about it. You'd be amazed at how many people would just spill their guts. You just ask them, how's your week going? And they just give it to you. And the door's wide. The problem is we don't ask because we don't want to know. We want to stand there and ignore them because I can get out of here quicker if I don't get into a conversation with these folks. Jesus says, as you're going through life, make disciples. Spread the gospel. Tell people. Teach them. Lead them. Tell them about why we celebrate this. People in our world have a whole different idea of Easter. And some of us, that's the, as far as it goes with us too, it's not about all the things the world says Easter's about. It's about the resurrected Lord. That came because he loves you and me and he wants us to continue that message and get it out to the world. 
Folks, if you're living in this world for you, the Bible says the person that keeps his life will lose it. The one who loses his life for my sake will find it. If you live in this life for you, you're never, ever going to spend eternity with the Lord. You must die to self. You must let Him live through you. There's a big difference in being someone with wings and victorious and someone that's acting like a worm, claiming to be a Christian. Don't be a wormy Christian. Okay? Be a victorious Christian. One that lives the life that Jesus paid for you to have. Okay? We're going to sing a song, and it's going to be a fun song, so stand up just a second. <coughs> This is a um, this is a fun song, and it is a um, a youth uh, a youth camp song. How many of you went to youth camp? You all know what that's about. Yeah. Did y'all go to youth camp? Yeah. And that's what's wrong. With y'all. <laughs> right. My life is in you, Lord. This is just a celebration song today. It says, my life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. In you, it's in you. And you repeat that. And it says, I will praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength, with all of my life, with all of my strength, all of my hope. It's in you. What, what, a, what a confession for us. It's in Him. So what I want you to do is you're going to repeat this phrase like I say, my life, life is in you, Lord, my strength, strength. You ought to yell it like you're talking. Is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. Can y'all do that much with me? My life, my life, life is in you.
Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.